One. Okay. Uh, yes, <clears throat> good morning, and thank you for joining us at Seattle Science Foundation for today's CV questions and answers. What a pleasure to introduce Dr. Jacques Morcos today. Uh, Dr. Morcos is a giant of our field and uh, does not really need an introduction. Uh, Dr. Morcos spent most of his career, 28 years, uh, at the University of Miami and recently became the chairman of the Vivian L. Smith, the Department of Neurosurgery at McGovern School of Medicine at UT Houston. So congratulations. Uh, Dr. Morcos is mostly known for his expertise in skull base um, and complex tumor surgery and all aspects of cerebrovascular surgery. And it's virtually impossible to list all of his accomplishments in a comprehensive manner. So just, just in brief. Dr. Morcos has been very involved with organized neurosurgery. He is the current president-elect of AANS. He has been involved with the World Federation, American Academy of Neurological Surgeon, World Academy of Neurological Surgeon. Um, he served as uh, the chair or president of the CV section, the North American Skull Base Society, among others. Uh, Dr. Morcos authored over 200 publications gave close to a hundred of visiting professor lectureships. He is on an editorial board of the Journal of Neurosurgery, Neurosurgery, World Neurosurgery, and, and other journals. Uh, he also trained 25 skull base and cerebrovascular fellows to date, who went on to having very successful careers uh, themselves. Um, importantly, when I mention Dr. Morcus's name to my neurosurgical friends and, and mentors who know him, the, the universal response is, what a great surgeon, but what an amazing, what an amazing person. Uh, Dr. Morcos will give us a presentation titled Bypass Surgery for Flow Augmentation, the Marriage of Flow Measurements and Surgical Technique. Um, Dr. Morcos, we are so happy to have you this morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. What a nice and generous introduction. And it's good to be among friends, particularly Older friends, I don't mean old by age, but like Cameron McDougall, whose, whose career started with mine in the mid-90s at the BNI. So, and thank you for, for this. Let me let me share the screen and and get going. And uh, let me see if you can see my screen. One second. Are you able to see my screen and hear That's me okay? Great. That okay. Was great. Thank you. Um, thank you again. Uh, I will try to cover a topic dear to my heart, which is try to bring in some science into bypass surgery. When I mean science, I mean quantitative science, such as flow measurements. And I thought I will, and as you know, after 28 years in Miami, obviously most of, well, all of this work is from my time at University of Miami for the last two months, I have been at this fantastic department here, neurosurgery at UT Houston, which by the way, was voted this week, not voted, came in number four in the Blue Ridge NIH funding report uh, in the US, which is actually quite an amazing achievement for the team that was here, of course, before I joined. Um, and so I'm very excited about the road ahead. Um, so uh, some of this work would you will find in this publication of last year, uh, particularly if my, with my first author by my uh, former fellow, Nick Khan, who is University of uh, Tennessee in Memphis now, and, and uh, uh, many of the stroke neurologists and uh, uh, neurosurgical residents at the University of Miami. Um, so I wanted to look back at bypass for ischemia and moya moya that I have done 
over a 20 year period. Uh, I've excluded aneurysms for this paper. I'll cover some aneurysms at the end of the talk. Um, I did three different anastomoses over time. I labeled these 1D, 1R, 1D, 2R, and 2D, 2R, meaning one donor, one recipient, one donor, two recipients, and the so-called double barrel. This is, you know, the simple uh, STA, MCA bypass uh, uh, schematic. Moya Moya disease, let's go through an example. Uh, this is a classic 32-year-old female. She actually was a nurse in the stroke unit, uh, ironically, had Moya Moya presented with symptoms. This is her classic angiogram finding. You can see the narrowing of the distal ICA. Uh, here is the attempt at collateral formation from the poster posterolateral choroidal to the and to the anterior choroidal and via PCA to the anterior circulation. Now, here is the first lesson of the day, I think. You look at this STA, and those of you who may not have been too familiar with bypasses might say, oh, there is no STA. This is so small, we can't do it. Well, no, you you'll be amazed once you dissect this STA as I will show you in a second, it can give excellent flow. Here is her vasomotor reactivity study that I always do using transcranial Doppler. It's very low, as expected. Uh, and I used to do SPECT with Diamox, but of course you can do CT perfusions, uh, MR perfusion, many other uh, 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 testing to document misery perfusion. So that's classic uh, incision mapping of the STA, uh, you, ice, you dissect it. In this case, I dissected two branches. I like to keep it small, uh, the bone flap targeted over the distal sylvian fissure. Uh, now, here is the use of, again, I have, I forgot to mention in my slides, I have no disclosures to make. I have no relationship financially with any of this company or any others, but it is extremely useful. The, uh, this flow probe, you measure your recipient flow. And this, by the way, a lot of my work, of the work I'm talking about really has been pioneered by my good friend Fadi Sherbel at uh, UIC and his colleagues. And that's the concept of measuring flow in cerebrovascular surgery. Uh, so I'm measuring three cc per minute in the recipient artery. Then I the, cut the STA. This miserable low, small STA you saw actually measured 60 cc per minute uh, when you when you freed it up from the skin around it and then we proceeded i proceeded with the anastomosis in this particular case i did running technique it's a little faster but uh, i do do interrupted technique if it's a very small vessel meaning like 0.5 millimeter or lower uh, now then you finish the bypass and you measure the flow Remember, the cut flow was 60 cc per minute. When I finished the bypass, you can see the cut, the bypass flow is 64 cc per minute. What does that mean? It means uh, the cut flow index, as defined by Charbel, the ratio of the bypass flow to the cut flow, is essentially 100%, meaning the brain took every drop of blood flow you could give it. Uh, so I've tabulated all those numbers on all of my patients uh, in Miami. And uh, uh, so, uh, and I'll show you the data. So this is patient did well, post-op CTA. You can see very nice patent bypass. Here she is. Uh, and I brought her six weeks later and did the other side because remember both sides were pretty bad on uh, physiological testing. And here is a final angiogram of both uh, mirror bypasses, one side. And she still works as a nurse uh, after many years uh, 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 in, in Miami. Now, I don't think Moya Moya is very controversial. Maybe we can discuss in the Q&A session later the role of indirect bypass in Moya Moya in adults, which I don't have the time to show you all the literature, but I do not believe is anywhere close to as effective as a direct bypass or combined direct and indirect. The, uh, but the controversy 
is and continues to be uh, with steno-occlusive disease. Uh, this is a case. So wh wh why do some of us keep doing bypasses for select, and I repeat, very select patients with steno-occlusive disease that cannot be stented or don't have an easy or, or have failed medical treatment? Uh, because you have patients like this. Look at the watershed infarct in the right hemisphere. Patient is having classic daily, and I re really mean daily, multiple TIAs, uh, perfusion dependent for a long time. Uh, he is 76. He has this carotid occlusion in the neck, uh, doesn't have enough collaterals, uh, doesn't have a good A1. Uh, and he's having symptoms, and the neurologist uh, uh, has maximized what they are able to do for him. And you can see the attempt at collateral formation. That's not very effective. And the SPECT, with and without Diamox, confirm misery perfusion. You can see the right hemisphere having a steel phenomenon from the opposite hemisphere when you give Diamox. So we, I, uh, we cannot sit on those patients. Look at the vasomotor reactivity study. Uh, it shows 19%. You want it to be close to 70% or higher to be normal. So this is very low. So I proceeded with a bypass. Uh, I did a, what I call a 1D, 1R, one donor, one recipient bypass. Uh, here is a post-op CTA. And the patient goes home two days later. The, and I keep showing his case when I give presentations because he's, of course, an, a very old patient of mine. But this man lived 10 years uh, till age 86 and died of uh, a, a heart attack at age 86 without any more TIAs uh, uh, to his right hemisphere. So it's because of multiple cases like this that some of us have seen that uh, some of us still strongly believe in the role of bypass surgery for very select steno-occlusive disease patients. So what is the study that we did? Um, I'm, I'm going to skip some details because you can see some of this in the publications, but we've looked at severity of disease, suitability of donor, how much collateral there was. I'm going to show you a little concept we introduced in that paper. Uh, and uh, you you will know, uh, particularly the accomplished angiographers among you will know that there are three groups of a collateral formation. You can go to, you can be, it can be transdural, it can be leptomeningeal or retrograde via the PCOM or across the ACOM. And this is what you're going to see in general. Uh, now, here is where we want, we thought we'd look at something interesting. Can we categorize the patients as having compensated or uncompensated perfusion deficit simply by looking at the angiogram? So we kind of took an angiogram like this. We overlaid the different injections and then looked if there was any zone uh, that was really not receiving good perfusion. Now, of course, this is completely qualitative and not quantitative. But a case like this, for, for example, there was uncompensated area uh, of perfusion. Uh, uh, we've done it on every case uh, retrospectively. We looked at, so keep in mind that concept, compensated versus uncompensated uh, 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 collateral formation. We looked at bypass patency. We looked at Matsushima grading uh, after bypass, a very popular use uh, of this grading scale. Ideally, we want all our patients to look like this. Several years after the bypass, they have a larger STA. Uh, this is another case. Uh, you can see how the patient started at the top, severe moya moya. You put an STA MCA bypass three months later, you can see the middle panel. And 11 years later, uh, you can see the bypass still going strong and very mature. Uh, there were a few, very as I'll show you the data in a second, a few uh, uh, acute closures of the bypass, meaning that during the same hospitalization. This is one of them. 
after a bypass being pated at the end of surgery, the next day, uh, asymptomatic loss of the Doppler signal that we do at the bedside. I rushed him straight back to surgery and he used a different recipient. The problem was with the recipient I chose was probably too small. So, and then the bypass you can see is patent after the revision and uh, he did uh, well long-term. Uh, the second thing I wanted to, uh, well, there are many lessons, but this is another one. I wanted to understand why do some cases have a delayed bypass occlusion years later uh, and without symptoms, almost always without symptoms. Uh, so this is a classic, not a classic, this is one case where after an initial patent anastomosis, little by little, the bypass closes off and you see this plethora of uh, transdural uh, indirect collateralization. Why does this happen in some patients? Does not happen in others? Uh, uh, you will see the data analysis in a second. Uh, when we did trans TCD vasomotor reactivity studied we, with CO2, uh, these the reference, as I said, should be above seventy percent. There's a formula for it, uh, and you can see severe impairment is less than thirty five percent. During COVID times, we, due to equipment issues, we had to use what I call the poor man's uh, TCD VMR. We use the breath holding index. Uh, it's a little easier to do, but it gives you the same uh, same measure, same concept. We followed patients many weeks, months, years, and uh, for CTA, MRA, and DSA. So I looked at 162 procedures in 124 patients. Uh, there was bilateral disease in 72. You can see our clinical follow-up isn't bad. Almost three years with a range of up to 21 years. Uh, angiographic follow-up was one year, nine months mean up to 12 or 13 years in some cases. Of course, I did more and more surgeries as my career progressed. And uh, the last, the previous seven years for, for, TIS, for Moya Moya and, um, and uh, uh, steno-occlusive disease uh, uh, did 107. Uh, okay, so we looked at everything we could look at. I'm not gonna, you're not gonna read this table, but uh, we looked at, every possible demographic marker, race, uh, gender, uh, comorbidities. We, we, we looked at everything, as I said, MRS pre-op, MRS post-op, Suzuki grading of the for the Moya Moyas, the type, as I said, type of collateralization, so on and so forth. I'll skip uh, some of that. Uh, another lesson of the day, patients can do very well Bypasses could be patent, but the, don't expect the VMR measurement by TCD to necessarily normalize. The lack of normalization does not mean the surgery has failed. For You can see here the mean VMR pre-op was 29% and post-op uh, became 39%. Uh, Spect uh, in the cases where we've done, we've like we've looked at that. We looked at type of suturing, SSEP change, etc. So that's another lesson. Those of us who are interested in minimizing unnecessary things that we do in the OR, <laughs> look at the SSEP changes. Essentially, unchanged in 159, got better during surgery in two cases, and in only one case. Did it decrease temporarily and returned? So, for simple STA MCA bypass, really there is no need to do SSEP. At least the way my practice uh, or in my hands. So those of you, uh, so it is definitely not an, a standard of care to say, oh, you must do SSEP for every cerebrovascular procedure. Well, the data shows it's. It, in my case, it was completely 
useless food, didn't achieve anything in, in changing what I was doing during the surgery. Look at the, I want you to look at the flow numbers. The mean, I'm sorry, median cut flow of the STA was about 52 cc per minute. But look at the range. Some cases had an STA flow when you cut the STA of 140 cc per minute. So I echo the warning not to call STA MCA bypass as a quote unquote low flow bypass. It's not always low flow. It can be huge flow. It can be too much flow. Look at the 140. I don't want 140 cc pouring into the hypoperfused hemisphere. Uh, look at the post bypass flow was 44 cc per minute median. And in one case, uh, almost 200 cc per minute. Look at the cut flow index median, 0.86, meaning 86% of the cut flow median uh, was uh, taken by the hemisphere. That tells you that I was uh, uh, quite selective in choosing patients. I didn't bypass right and left. If I was doing unnecessary bypasses, that number would be quite low because those bypasses would not be needed. So it's a law of supply and demand. So it's important to, to, to understand why in so many ways, why quantitative flow measurements are important in, in general in cerebrovascular surgery. So how did I, how did we do? What is the morbidity? So if you look at ischemic stroke from the surgery or ICH, those two numbers together, that's 0.6 plus 3.1, that's 3.7%, which is really not bad at all in this group of patients mixed moya moya and steno occlusive disease if you add the subdural hematoma wound complications respiratory failures and an mi if we we add all of those numbers you come up with 10% but most papers as you know uh, address the ne neurologic complications and uh, that's 3.7% I am not going to go in detail over the six patients that constituted those complications, but uh, there are always lessons to learn from every patient. You can see hemorrhage, stroke, hemorrhage, 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 hemorrhage. Those were the six uh, neurological complications. Here is a very interesting finding of one of the findings of the study. Remember when I talked about complete versus incomplete collateralization. Uh, if the patient had complete qualitative angiographic collateralization pre-op, re now remember, before I continue saying what I'm going to say, those patients were, were having symptoms. Those patients were having uh, uh, abnormal physiology, which is why I was operating on them. I'm not operating on asymptomatic angiograms. Uh, but in that subgroup, 36% uh, had delayed, delayed asymptomatic bypass occlusion versus the patients that had incomplete collateral angiographic formation pre-op. Only 4% had uh, delayed post-op uh, bypass occlusion. Huge difference. Uh, here it is graphic format, uh, the occluded bypasses in a delayed manner on the left and the patent bypasses on the right, uh, uh, stratified by collateral formation pre-op on the angiogram. What matters is how did the patients do? Well, you they did very well in general. Here is the modified ranking score uh, pre-op in blue post-op uh, in orange, uh, there is a shift to the left. Uh, we have uh, helped patients by doing the surgery by and large. Did it make a difference whether uh, the technique was 1D, 1R, 1D, 2R, 2D, 2R? I probably don't have enough numbers and power to prove it, uh, but you can see a trend 
if you look at the long-term patency rate near the bottom of the table, a trend for increased patency long-term, the more anastomoses you put in there. Uh, I will show you flow measurements as well in a second and, and talk about that. Uh, uh, the cut flow uh, uh, index, so there is a trend for increase, uh, the more, of course, you do the more anastomosis you put in. And I'll analyze that in a second. Now we looked at univariate and multivariate analysis, and there were only regarding bypass, what determines long-term bypass patency or occlusion. We could only come up with two factors, one of which I think it's a, I believe it's a, a random uh, uh, it's a chance finding because of the number of factors we looked at. That is the Hispanic race. Hispanic race was associated with uh, a higher incidence of delayed bypass occlusion. And I would need to see that confirmed by other groups. Uh, but the strongest determinant was this issue of complete or incomplete uh, uh, pre-op collateralization big difference as i showed you notice that the cut flow index was not a determinant of uh, in my series of delayed bypass occlusion long term let's show a little bit what i mean by 1d 2r uh, it's a one donor two recipient i'll show you a video of a 49 year old uh, man with moya moya disease I want to show you the numbers. Uh, every case I tabulate like this, I measure the cut flow, I measure the recipient flow. Uh, in the two recipients, I might do the bypass in. You can see very low flow, 4cc and 2cc. I then measure the flow in uh, one, uh, one anastomosis, and then I measure the flow in the second anastomosis after it's finished. Uh, you add the two, and that's your total bypass flow. You measure, you compare it to the initial STA cut flow. That's a ratio of cut flow index. Uh, so this is your classic Moya Moya. Here is very simple, straight incision. I, by the way, I probably mentioned it earlier. I do not add muscle or dura or anything like that. It's I find it messy and unnecessary. Uh, I like to use the Colorado needle. Uh, it makes it a little faster to dissect. Uh, I sometimes use the bipolar to uh, do what I'm showing here. It's a little also uh, it's a, a fairly uh, a quick. Uh, and here is a cut flow index. I'm doing ICG here. Uh, I'll skip through some of that. We're going to do the craniotomy, and we're going to put. Uh, 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 self, uh, this is a Spetzler uh, microsuction, very useful to collect uh, irrigation. And I'm going to identify in this particular case two recipients, one on the temporal side, one on the frontal side of the sylvan fissure. You may have to sacrifice tiny branches leaving those recipients. And we're going to do side to side anastomosis on one and end to side on the other. Notice the flow measurements. <clears throat> I, I will show you in a, uh, in a few minutes whether you should do site to site first or end to site first. Well, the problem is you don't always know. I don't always know at the beginning of the case if I need both anastomoses or not. If after the first one, the flow is very high, I don't want to add a second one. So if you know for sure you're going to need double anastomosis because the territories are isolated, you should do the side to side first, this one, and then the end to side. In this particular case, I did not know, so I did the end to side first. I, I don't really want to spend too much time on technique. Uh, if you have any technical question, please feel free to ask me at the end, but I'm going to skip through a little bit. Uh, that's how I do my arteriotomy. Uh, I put the heel first uh, and to be honest what depends if I am 
helping a fellow or a resident put in sutures. I may change my technique. I obviously generally would put interrupted if I am helping a trainee. So we can always correct it. And uh, but otherwise, if I can, I'd rather use running. It's a little faster. And we remove the first one. Uh, we, we This is the first one completed. Uh, and I'm going to measure the flow. Uh, it's 43 cc per minute. Uh, I proceed to now, uh, by the way, the ICG looks very green because here I'm experimenting with the saturation uh, of the ICG. Uh, so you see why you want to put the side to side first because to do it, I have to close this bypass temporarily to be able to do the end, the side to side first. Here is how I do side to side. It's not an operation for the beginner. I let me say that because obviously, if we screw up this anastomosis and we end up with occlusion here, the entire double bypass will will be occluded. So you don't want to be doing this as your first few bypasses. You need, I think, a little experience under your belt. So here we're doing. You can do running at the back. You can do it endoluminally, exoluminally. It doesn't really matter. You do one wall. Here I'm doing running. And I will tighten the suture one by one, the loop. And then I will do the second wall. Now I remove this. So I have double bypasses. Uh, and I am going to measure the floor. Remember, it was 43 after one anastomosis. Now it's 60. So this is, of course, higher than the cut flow because we have two openings in the STA and there is a willing recipient bed that is receiving this bypass flow. Uh, I, will, I will show you a kind of a physics analogy at the end of the talk why this is the case. So, uh, so here are the final numbers, 60 cc final bypass flow. Uh, that's what the bone opening looks like. And here is an, a nice angiogram showing very well the double. You probably cannot see it at this magnification, but the double bypasses are open uh, and good, good uh, collateralization. Um, um, I'm not going to show you a double barrel. You know what it is anterior and parietal branch of the STA, each one is giving one recipient temporal and frontal end to side. That's a classic double barrel. I'm going to skip this video for time. Of course, my series is not only STA, MCA. It's, uh, there are cases of occipital artery to pica bypass for vertebrobasilar insufficiency. And so I'll, I'll quickly show you this one, look, you can barely see the vertebrobasilar system. The patient was having posterior circulation uh, ischemia ongoing, uh, not nothing to stent. Uh, so that's how I do occipital to pica bypass. Uh, uh, obviously, it's more tedious to isolate the occipital artery. Uh, you have to do a, a partial far lateral approach identify the fourth segment of the pica, uh, make sure you don't uh, injure any of the th uh, brainstem perforator. I am going to be anastomosing end to side occipital artery to this segment of the pica. I need to make sure, see what I'm doing here. I'm pulling the pica to make sure I know where the last perforator to the brainstem leaves. Here it is, you see it just emerging. So obviously my bypass needs to be distal to that and that's where i'm going to put it uh, so we don't create temporary ischemia in the brainstem as we do this operation uh, again i'll skip quickly uh, to maybe to the completed bypass uh, you put a glove as a background uh, here is the occipital artery it's deeper than the stmca but you can see there is plenty of room uh, same thing, I like to cut with a, a sharp a beaver blade rather than scissors. And we are going to do uh, the anastomosis. Uh, 
I am doing uh, running here, and then I will do, I believe, interrupted on the other side. Uh, here is a completed uh, bypass, uh, and I'll show you the post-op angiogram. <clears throat> uh, here is you can see the nice anastomosis occipital to pica it took over uh, the vertebrobasilar uh, circulation so this so-called orphan disease of vertebrobasilar insufficiency we really need to address it and not uh, ignore those patients because a small group of them will benefit uh, you can do very creative bypasses like bonnet bypasses. I did one case where I went from the STA on one side through uh, bicoronally to the other side because the common carotid was occluded on the side of the symptoms. And the only donor I could find was the contralateral STA used a saphenous vein. I'm going to uh, skip that. These are very unusual cases. So I can conclude from this study uh, that direct bypass is really highly effective in select, well, uh, in, in, in most Moya Moya disease patients, but select steno-occlusive disease patients. Uh, you can see their clinical presentations in a typical North American series for Moya Moya. Incomplete collateralization on pre-op angio was seen in 76% of the cases. Uh, you can see that, I, I guess, in experienced hands, patency, immediate patency of the direct bypass is extremely high. There is only one case in the 162 operations that uh, I was unable to achieve a patent bypass in the operating room. So immediate bypass patency is 100%. In my series, you will see that number again come up delayed bypass patency is 90%. You can see the, the median flow measurement. Uh, I showed those a little earlier. Now, here is what was very interesting. Again, as I want to mention the pioneering work of Fadi Sherbel at uh, University of Illinois in Chicago. So I have findings that do not uh, line up with, uh, with Fadi's series. So here, here, is, here are the two series. And I'm trying to learn what is the difference. So in 2019, the Sharbel and Sepi Amin Hanjani were the two surgeons in that series, published their 146 cases. Uh, uh, the, <coughs> that's the left column. And I'm comparing my series. Uh, you can see the breakdown and try to figure out what is different between our two series. Maybe... I did a little more 1D, 2Rs, uh, and uh, otherwise, what is the main difference? The main difference is that in the UIC series, they use concomitant EDAS along with the direct bypass. You can see in mine, I don't. Uh, the other findings are similar, but that made a huge difference, I believe, in the final results. Uh, at least regarding bypass patency. So bypass long-term patency in the UIC series is 76%. Uh, in mine is 91%. So obviously that's not a reflection of technique at all. Obviously, uh, very experienced surgeons, uh, long-term patency is not a surrogate of surgical technique. If your surgical technique was poor, you would have an immediate bypass occlusion rate that would be alarming. But that's not the case. Most of their cases were patent immediately. So the only difference, and by the way, these numbers are probably too many to read, is uh, segregation of cut flow index. In their series, you can see why cut flow index is a very strong predictor of bypass patency long-term. In my series, it is not. And again, it goes back to the fact that they're putting in muscle and dura and encouraging indirect, not in, encouraging collateral formation. And therefore, their direct conduit, the direct bypass conduit, 
is less needed than it is in my series uh, where I am not putting muscle and dura. So I think this explains the discrepancy. So I think uh, with the, in, in, in uh, experienced hands, you can expect results like this. Surgical morbidity mortality at 30 days of 3.7%. And actually, when I followed my patients long-term, stroke or ICH post-op overall was 6.2% and death only 0.6%. That beats natural history by a mile, as you know whichever way you want to look at it. Five-year cumulative stroke rates are 82% in the natural history. Um, so there is no question that at least uh, if done, at least in my hands, the way the, the, the protocol I have followed, that works, that helps patients. Uh, let me cover some something specific about the 1D, 2R, uh, I'm not going to go into details of the physics and flow dynamics, but it is important uh, to, for people to understand it, to understand this whole blood flow measurement business. Uh, there are really two physics equations we need to understand. The Bernoulli equation, again, I'm not going in detail with this, but more importantly, the Hagen-Poiseuille's law. Why is that? because Hagen-Poiseuille's law is exactly equivalent to, if you remember your high school electricity physics, to Ohm's law, completely equivalent. Flow, uh, current, resistance, uh, uh, voltage versus delta P, and so forth. Again, there's no time. If you want to really read in detail our analysis of this, I have two publications. One, uh, you, can, you can read those in the appendix of those uh, papers, those of you who are math or physics inclined. Uh, but I tell you, this has been tremendously helpful to help me understand uh, uh, the flow measurements I was getting in these 1D, 2R. This is a 1D, 2R final construct. And as we said, I'm gonna skip the video. As we said in our paper, we did an analogy with an electric circuit and were able to actually predict and calculate the vascular resistance in each segment of the 1D2R bypass. Again, no time to go in detail, but it's all in those two publications. So <laughs> these are the steps of a 1D2R. Uh, generally, if I know I'm going to do two anastomoses, I will do the side-to-side -side first. I, uh, there are three steps. You can see them graphically here. Side to side first, me measure the flow, end to side to the second anastomosis, measure the flow in it, re-measure the flow in the first anastomosis. I was, fast, I was very interested in knowing how does constructing a second anastomosis affect the flow in the first anastomosis? And you will see what I came up with. Uh, I'll, I'll skip some of that. Uh, similar to what I, this is uh, did in the large series. But here is what the results are in the 1D2R series of 21 patients, which, by the way, is the largest uh, published on the topic. And I really would hope more uh, bypass surgeons utilize the 1D2R. Uh, uh, it is very useful. Uh, the bypass patency was 100% immediately, 90% in delayed. The cut flow index after the first anastomosis was 0.64. When I built the second anastomosis, it became 0.94. Uh, the, you can see I, uh, you increase the flow on average by 50%. Uh, and uh, th that's the main finding. So here is a, a graphic of what you can expect. The cut flow before you start the bypass is 57 on a median. Uh, after you do the first anastomosis, the median is 36. You do the se second anastomosis, it rises up to 51, 52, closer to the cut flow. So that's really the benefit of a double anastomosis. Here is a graphic to show you it didn't matter finally uh, in the final analysis whether you built, 
your site to site first or your end to site first, the final result was the same. But as I said earlier, if you know that you're going to do uh, two anastomoses, it's more logical to do the site to site first. So when you construct the second end to site anastomosis, there is blood flow going in from the side to side uninterrupted. Clinical outcome, very similar to the overall series, a move to modif uh, to better MRS uh, uh, post-op. Again, this is the math physics analysis of resistors in parallel and resistors in series. I refer you to the paper to really get into the weeds of all this, but very interesting to understand this, to, to predict uh, how your bypasses are going to do and what the flow is <coughs> and what the resistance is. So when I did this, it occurred to me, I need to introduce two new concepts. I'm going to call them, I call them Sarah and Sassy. Sarah is a second anastomosis relative augmentation which is a ratio of CFI final by CFI initial. And SASI, second anastomosis sink index, is a ratio of the final flow of the second anastomosis divided by the total flow. They're related concepts, but again, you'll have to read in detail to understand the subtle difference between them. Uh, this is a typical case uh, of uh, a nice uh, result from a 1D2R. There is only one patient in the 1D2R series that occluded their bypasses, delayed manner, bilaterally. It shows you that there is something in the patient that occludes their bypasses in a delayed manner, biologically, whether it's related to VEGF or whatever factor is, and it's not a technical issue. It's a patient uh, milieu issue. This, I'll show you the, pa the patient. Look at the top uh, top row is my, the right bypass. Bottom row is the left bypass. I did them, obviously, a few months apart. It, both, uh, it was patent at the beginning and beginning to disappear in the middle. And then it's gone by the time you're on the right side a year later. But patient completely asymptomatic with uh, very good transdural collateral formation. Uh, again, same patient, both sides. Here is an analysis of 1D1R, 2D2R, and why I like the 1D2R. And maybe we can, you can, if you'd like to ask me in uh, session, like to go over that in more detail. Uh, <coughs> uh, I'm going to skip those things. It's, it's an analysis of why the 1D2R is really beneficial and how Sarah and Sassy can be uh, increased. Uh, I think I have uh, five minutes. Um, I, I realized I didn't leave enough time to discuss the aneurysm issue, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll show it maybe by examples. Of course, the main difference in measuring blood flow in for aneurysm surgery versus moya moya or ischemia is in aneurysm surgery, it's a flow replacement bypass. In Moya Moya and uh, steno occlusive disease is a flow augmentation bypass. Uh, if you think of bypasses for aneurysms, uh, there are many ways to look at them, but I've always uh, followed in my mind this table. Really, you can make it very complicated, but I think this keeps it very simple five categories only. Uh, it all depends what is your donor and what are the number of anastomoses. If you're using one, you can read for yourself, one anastomosis with an intracranial donor, then that's an insight to bypass. If you're using one anastomosis with a an local extracranial donor like STA or OA, uh, then those are your SCMCA and OA PICA bypass. To, if you use a distant donor, uh, 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 meaning common carotid, external carotid, ICA, 
or vertebral, you have three choices. You may use a short graft, intracranial, so that's intracranial, intracranial bypass, short graft, extracranial, or a long graft. That's it. You can now invent any bypass you'd like. I promise you I can make it fit into one of those five categories. Um, uh, maybe I'll show this very briefly. This is a patient with a fusiform PCA aneurysm that failed a stent coiling uh, and was referred by my endovascular colleague to consider a bypass because it's obviously not clippable. You can see the stent goes all the way to the level of uh, P3, P4. So how are we going to do this? The best way I thought was to go to the parieto occipital artery interhemispheric fissure with the occipital artery. And here is the position. You use gravity in your favor. And here is the occipital artery. I showed you earlier how to dissect it. I'm just going to skip straight through. Uh, you don't need self-retaining retractor. With a lumbar drain, the hemisphere falls away. And... I'm using actually navigation to find the parieto occipital artery of on CTA. And uh, here it is. And I'm going to plug in the occipital, I'm sorry, the, yes, the occipital artery into it and try to make it easier on myself by liberating it. Here is the blood flow measurement. It's telling me the occipital artery carries 58 uh, cc per minute. Excellent flow. So this is more than enough uh, to uh, replace the PCA. Uh, you saw me drilling a channel in the bone so the occipital artery does not get kinked or occluded by the skin when I close. And we're going to go straight down here. It is deep for sure, but you can see plenty of horizontal room. We're not going to waste time watching me doing the suturing. We're going to go straight to the end. Here is running technique uh, and release. Now, of course, I don't have access to the aneurysm. So we take the patient. Oh, but look at the flow. The flow is only 10 cc per minute. Of course, there is no demand yet. We have not occluded the PCA. So we're going to combine this with endovascular <coughs> sacrifice of the PCA by my Good colleague, Eric Peterson, you can see the next day he occludes this and then the bypass takes over and you can see very nice anastomosis. And uh, so that's a very nice use. Of course, there are many examples of how to use, how to be complementary. Um, and that's a, a post-op patent bypass. Um, I, I think I'm going to stop here because the other cases will I cannot do them in one or two minutes. They are multiple types of aneurysms that were used quantitative flow measurements to decide, do I need a radial artery? Do I need this STA and so forth? I, I don't want to, to keep going through this. So I'm going to stop here and maybe maybe answer, well, get into the conversation session. Thank you very much. I see uh, Dr. Monteith has raised hand. Thanks, Jack. That was uh, awesome. Um, your uh, level of expertise and this is uh, it's uh, just amazing to see uh, the detail with which you've looked at this. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is the the so called half and half bypass. You, you mentioned with Charbel series there was the EDAS in addition to the bypass. Uh, can you clarify, um, a lot of people will fold the dura or maybe put some muscle, as you said, but um, the so-called half and half where one, the parietal branch typically is left in continuity uh, and the frontal branch is used as a direct bypass. We've certainly seen anecdotally that the parietal branch, uh, at least on Doppler, appears to have less flow after you've opened up the frontal branch. Um do you have any comment on the so-called half and half versus the additional EDAS just laying on the dura? Yeah. You know, as you know, uh, there are so many variations on this theme 
and uh, the alphabet soup of uh, EDAS and EDAMs and all that. I have not used, I've not, I cannot tell you anything from personal experience because I've never used it as such. My pediatric neurosurgical colleagues uh, love to use the inside to uninterrupted uh, parietal branch, uh, of course, makes the surgery quicker. Um, there is good work from uh, Peter Vashkozy in Berlin, who has a very decent Moya Moya series, uh, doing quantitative measurements and just indirect bypasses just do not come anywhere close in uh, providing uh, flow of the caliber of the direct bypass. And of course, it's not immediate, as you know. Um, uh, in children, you can get away with anything. You, you you open the skull, you look at the brain, you close it, they're going to do fine. I just, I am convinced from my series, the work of Peter, the work of Fadi, that direct bypass is superior. Uh, it doesn't answer your question because I simply have not tried it to give you personal uh, reflections on on the, the half and half thing. Uh, Follow-up question. Um... Status post uh, STAMCA for Moya Moya for patients that have ongoing ischemia in the ACA territory. We, we've had several of those cases that have a robust bypass on angiography. What's your approach to dealing with those patients? Do you uh, do additional bypasses? Uh, <clears throat> how do you approach those cases? Yes, I have done it twice, only twice, and I took. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I took a seg. I had used one branch only. I took a segment of the other branch, the parietal. I can't remember which, and I lengthened the STA to reach nearer the interhemispheric fissure. Now I didn't go down the interhemispheric fissure. I only anastomosed to an A4 branch, you know, just parasagically. That's all you needed. Uh, my uh, friend Tanikawa in Hokkaido uh, has several such cases, uh, and he has very nice videos showing uh, that uh, technique, but they're rare. I've, I've only had to do this twice. Yeah, one, one final to lengthen it because it doesn't reach otherwise. Right. One, one final question. Uh, obviously, you measure the, the cut flow, and you, measure, you mentioned a case where you had flow of up to 200 cc's a minute is there ever a case where you do would do the cut flow and the number would be so high that you would uh not do a direct bypass or, or what do you do in that situation you've you've got a uh, a fire hose uh with 200 cc's a minute uh and you've already cut it so the, the indirect's out at that point what do you do in that situation i love that question and if i had more time i would have shown you a very dramatic video of I had just finished a bypass, the flow was huge. And the minute I re removed the temporary clip, I could see not quite subarachnoid hemorrhage, but there was immediate hyperemia of the brain around it. So what I did, uh, I took two curved permanent aneurysm clips and uh, tangentially stenosed the bypass why did I put two? Because I, I put, like, I'm sorry, you can see my finger. I put one here and one here so that, uh, you know, the Bernoulli's equation and stuff, so that the caliber decrease is gradual, not sudden. I was worried I was going to occlude my bypass. It worked perfectly. I The flow dropped from uh, 130 down to 40, 40 cc per minute, which is very close to my median uh, flow measurements in the entire series which was 52 patient didn't turn hair i it was very clear this patient was about to have a hyperperfusion injury uh very good question and i, I i've only had to do this once uh the other cases where uh i avoid doing uh well as i said you don't start a case knowing for sure you need a double anastomosis or not the cases where I got 115, 120, obviously I'm not going to do a second anastomosis. So yeah, that is, uh, that's a kind of the clip technique. Uh, I hope you don't encounter it too many times, but it's a, it's a, it's a good technique to do.
Thank you. Uh, good tips to know. Thanks. Um, Cliff, I think we probably have time for one more question. Yep. Um, again, thanks for that excellent talk, uh, Dr. Marcos. Where do you use quantitative MRA in your workflow? I know Dr. Charbel started to use it in his. Well, uh, we didn't have it in Miami due to multiple factors, but it is arriving here in Houston. I, I love it. I've tried to convince them in Miami, couldn't get them to, you know, we're not going to get into the details of why it didn't make it there. So I, do, I have not used it. I've only seen it reported by all my good cerebrovascular friends who have them in their centers, and I don't. And luckily here, the minute I arrived in Houston, the stroke neurologist under Louise McCullough and the administration saw immediately the the, the use of it, uh, the, the, the utility of it. So that's my answer to you. Um, there is if, a... if the audience doesn't know what you're talking about, you're talking about the NOVA technique, the quantitative MRA, yeah. Um, thank you very much. There is a question from the chat uh, on the period on bypasses in, in pediatric patients. When would you recommend or prefer a direct bypass in pediatric patient? Um, uh, I have done it in a few instances where the indirect that was done already by my colleague, pediatric neurosurgeons, just did not work. There wasn't enough collateral. Um, I've seen that in uh, sickle cell, particularly young children with sickle cell. And I have, uh, luckily, in the cases I've done, they had not sacrificed, or there was one, at least one branch remaining or something to use to do direct bypass. But th that's that's when I've used it. I have no problem with, I, I'm when I say pediatric, I mean, if you're 17, I'm going to do a direct bypass. I'm talking really young, young children, uh, their, their ability to, to uh, mount collaterals is so good. I think indirect bypass is the way to go, at least as a first run. And the, the, the series of Scott and Steinberg and others uh, su support that for young children. Dr. Monti. Yeah. I uh, just had a follow-up question. Um, you, you'd mentioned sickle cell. Um, what's your approach? Is it any different for patients with sickle cell? And uh, to sort of add on to that, um, patients who need anticoagulation, this is always a, uh, a challenge when to restart anticoagulation after a bypass. Uh, you, you mean anticoagulation, not antiplatelets? Correct. Yeah. I mean, typically we would do it on aspirin, um, right. but uh, with the uh, sickle cell patients, uh, one, do you do anything different with them? And then two, for patients who are on anticoagulation, uh, how do you approach that? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think, I, well, I mean, the sickle cell patients, I, my attention in on them not having a sickle cell crisis perioperatively, I don't do, you know, with the uh, hypervolemia, I don't do anything different technically with their bypasses compared to others. Their vessels are usually, well, their vessels are tougher, uh, tougher in the sense they're much thinner and tougher to anastomose. And as you know, is that uh, almost wet toilet paper kind of feel. What we published uh, recently, and, and Cameron may be interested, I don't know how much Cameron uses transradial approach for, for angiograms, but uh, in sickle cell patients, uh, uh, we, uh, they're more likely to fail uh, transradial approach. So you may, you know, but anyway, uh, that, that's the only thing different. And the, the anticoagulation question? Oh, anticoagulation? I mean, g give me like a scenario such as who, who would be, you mean like if they have AFib or something or like AFib that? AFib or, or maybe a DVT or something like that. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't restart them on full dose heparin while they're in the hospital. Most patients are going to go home day two. Uh, I would, uh, uh, you know, I would, I, I don't, I must say, I haven't encountered this too often. I'm thinking what I would have done with them. <laughs> I, I, I feel very nervous, full anticoagulation within 48. After 48 hours, I probably would do half measure uh, anticoagulation and then transition uh, 
to to oral. The problem is, as you know, it's not uncommon after these after STA MCA to got this hygroma that may linger on at least radiologically. You know, it's there, and the brain doesn't fully expand for a while. It's not like after a regular craniotomy. Uh, so I, I, I'd like to avoid it if I can. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, one one more related question from the chat. Uh, what's your standard protocol medication protocol um for bypass in low flow and high flow states, and um whether you what what's your medical management yeah. um for hyperperfusion. Uh, medication, everybody is on full dose aspirin, 325 milligram pre-op, the day of surgery, post-op. Everybody is on prophylactic sub-Q heparin or prophylactic Lovenox for DVT. Uh, this is actually true for my entire practice. Any craniotomy, any inpatient gets, you know, I don't skip the so-called uh, DVT prophylaxis dose. Um, I put patients on Kepra for seizure prophylaxis. Um, those are the, the meds I'm, that would be on. Uh, drugs for hyperperfusion syndrome. Uh, it's I mean, it depends what the blood pressure is. I assume uh, Dr. Uh, Juan Carlos Gomez Vega is asking what, how to monitor the blood pressure. Depends on the patient. I don't want them breakthrough hypertension. Uh, most of the time, I'm going to want to achieve their normal range of uh, blood pressure and certainly not very low and certainly not very high. So blood pressure ma uh, management in the ICU. <coughs> Great. Thank you. I'm not sure if um, Dr. McDougall or anyone, anyone, any other panelists have anything else to say but it was an amazing lecture and thank you thank you so so much for joining us it's it's inspiring it's uh the um, I, I would say for us as fellows it's a little mixed feelings as to what our practice is going to look like as junior faculty <laughs> why, why why do you say that this should encourage you you sound despondent well i think no no it's it 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 is it is inspiring it's very encouraging. It's you, you know, as you mentioned, the, the controversy about bypass for stenoclusive disease. Right. Yeah, I mean that. That's you know. Uh, yeah, I mean I. You know, uh, it's. Uh, I don't know whether intracranial stenting is going to resurface. I mean, we we all hope that it would solve this problem, but obviously it didn't. Uh, but perhaps endovascularly, the future holds some promise. Uh, my advice, if you're going to start doing bypasses for steno-occlusive disease, you have to be so careful and so selective. In Miami, by, they had seen actually the good results in, in the 46 patients I had done. My stroke neurologists were more aggressive than me in wanting a bypass. They would send me patients. No, I say, no, 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 no. Come on. No, no, no. If we're going to do it right, we have to follow objectively what's their hyperperfusion. So you have to be very careful because there is absolute room for disaster. I didn't have chance to talk about the Chinese, the Chinese study, CMOS, but, uh, so, you know, that showed again, a failure of uh, bypass to improve uh, the outcome of patients with steno occlusive disease. I didn't mention it, not because I don't want to mention it, but because, again, the devil is in the detail, we've, we've written a group of us, not a rebuttal, but a, and not even a critique, but comments on that study that's published. Uh, you, you know, if the audience is interested, they can read both the study and our uh, published uh, editorial about it. But uh, again, the conclusion of that study is, well, perhaps we should choose more severe cases to do bypass on more severe M1 stenosis and, and so forth. But it, it's still an ongoing topic. Um, yeah. Thank yeah, you. That's a whole other, whole other can of worms. The, the, it's, just, it's hard to believe that we haven't been able to demonstrate a subgroup where we, where we have benefit. It's just 
it's really perplexing to me. You know, it, it's, you know, for so long, even with the acute stroke, you know, we kind of knew it worked. We, we, we had this right. concept that blood is good for the brain. And, yeah. it, but it took, it took 20 years to demonstrate that we could, you know, technically do it. And I, I just have to believe that it's still, it, it's still the case for the, for the atherosclerotic intracranial stenosis. But I just, I don't know how we get to, to the, the subgroup where we can reliably show benefit. It's, it's really been a, a frustrating but, experience. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem is external, internal validity in these randomized study, of course, is outstanding. The problem is external validity. Like, you know, like these anecdotal cases, like I showed the, the 76 year old guy right. early on. Or if you go back to the cost study, if you remember the cost study, the average time for randomization was 72 days. Well, all of us, all of us have patients. If you're going to sit 72 days on them, they're going to stroke their hemisphere. So, yeah, or they don't need to bypass in the first it, place. Exactly. So, but that's what it was. Um, yeah, but, but uh, talking about thrombectomy, man, are am I happy? We were not discouraged by those five negative studies early on. I mean, people should have said, well, are you crazy guys still doing? There are five negative studies and I'm glad we did. Look, what a game changer that is. You know, it's, it's kind of small, small things, small, small uh, time windows, time opportunities when you have that, you know, the, those the, the studies that eventually prevailed, you know, just happened to be already in the works when the other ones were failing. Uh, otherwise, they, they never right. would have got off the ground. So. Yeah. yeah. Someday we'll figure out a way to do the to do the bypass for the. I I think we've kept you uh, longer than we uh, said we would. We appreciate the generosity of your time, and uh, we we enjoyed the the beautiful lecture you gave and the knowledge you shared with us. So we really appreciate you being with us, and it's just been wonderful personally to see you. So, best of luck in Houston and your new uh, role there, and and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. And guys, thank you for all what you've been doing. That series is amazing. And, and I know people love watching it. Uh, occasionally, you have a bad choice like today, but generally, you have excellent <laughs> choices. But thank thank well, you. The, very only much. Reason, the only reason people like watching it is not for us. It's for, it's for our stars <laughs> like you. So thank you so much for uh, co contributing. Thanks. Bye, thank everybody. Bye-bye now.